Good afternoon. Welcome to Think Tech Hawaii's Movers, Shakers, and Reformers. I'm your host, Carl Campagna. I'm going to begin today's show with a Trump dump. It's what I've uh, kind of been doing for the last couple of weeks, uh, several weeks perhaps, is uh, just uh, throwing in some commentary on some things that have been happening. Uh, so in the last couple of days, uh, what has come up are two different things. Number one, there's Trump saying that he wants to pull the United States out of the Paris Climate Agreement. Okay, and then there's also the reports coming out that he wants to repeal or pull back or recall the mandatory contraception bill uh, portion of the uh, Affordable Care Act. Okay, just real quick, with the contraception piece, an important thing to know is we are right now, as a result of the contraception mandate, we have the fewest number of abortions across the country than we've had in over 40 years. And that is as a result of the mandatory insurance coverage for contraception. That is a real thing. I'm going to say, first of all, I am personally, I am pro-choice. I am pro-contraception. I am also anti-abortion. I don't think we should have them just all over the place. They need to be minimized and reduced as far as possible. I, what I want to know is how it's possible you can call yourself anti-abortion and refuse and be unwilling to provide an alternate solution. They want to pull this back and provide what? I, I, that, that's kind of like if you've got a water leak, you know, a leak in your water faucet, it's saying the best way to solve the leak in your water faucet is to turn the faucet all the way on. That doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Not at all. Uh, next week, I'm going to go into the climate thing, where he's about to pull us, up, pull us out of the climate agreement, is, is what the reports are, of this Paris agreement. We're going to be the only major country in the world that is going to not be a part of this. And we are the second largest producer of, of gases, of greenhouse gases. And we're just going to pull out of it. For the purpose of what? a few coal jobs that he's promised to get when really we have 150 times more renewable energy and renewable energy jobs than we do coal jobs why aren't we retraining people why aren't we moving in that direction so anyway there's my trump dump for the day uh, we can we can let that go and talk about it more later for the rest of this show um i wanted to talk about and i'm really thrilled today i wanted to talk about a, a couple of different issues um i'm going to start off with primarily though I want to talk about the big tent theory in politics, and specifically here in Hawaii. The values and, and the consequences and, I don't know, the, some of the challenges within uh, that idea. So to help this discussion, I'm very thrilled today to have Mr. Alex Santiago, former chair of the state party, uh, as well as director of the No Vote, No Grumble program. Welcome to the show, Mr. Alex Santiago. Oh, thank you for having me on. Thank you for so joining. So nice to get to meet you and talk to you and get to know you. I'm uh, thrilled. No, <laughs> this, is, this is the first time. Uh, yeah. It's not the first time we've met, but it's the first time we've actually had a chance right, to really talk. Right, so. Right, right. Um, so thank you for the, coming to the show. Thanks for having me on. Um, before we go into the topic uh, of the day, uh, tell us a bit about, you know, I, I just laid a little bit up, but tell us a bit about, about yourself, what sure. you've done, and how you've gotten where you are now. Sure. I, I usually start by saying I'm a social worker by background. My profession is uh, I'm a social worker, and uh, I teach at the university right now, the macro policy stuff. I love it. I found my calling, I think. Uh, but my previous life was in politics. I was a state representative from 1990 to 2000, representing the district of the North Shore. I retired in 2000, so I walked out the front door. I didn't get kicked out by my community. I, I kind of wanted to make sure that it was, you know, you leave when you're still wanted kind of a thing. But uh, I enjoyed it. It was 10 years, 10 wonderful years. I served during a time when I think the culture was a little different back in those days, uh, how politics run. Anyway, so when I got Through out... the 90s into 2000. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and I had been involved, actually, from before. And... Long story about how I actually got into running for office, but uh, it was a it was a the right choice for me to make at the time. Uh, since then, since retiring, I have done a number of different things. I started the organization, or or I was one of the founders of Focus, protecting Hawaii's Ohana children, underserved, elderly, and disabled. Yes, it, it was meant to be an advocacy voice for the underserved. They've kind of taken it on a different path since uh, there was a disagreement between the board and myself, the board that I put together, but that's a whole other story. Um, and, and so I started that. That was uh, a major part of 
post uh, politics. And um, then I am a consultant now, and I'm with the No Vote No Grumble program, which I'm really, really uh, excited to be a part of. It's under the Partners in Development Foundation uh, organization, and we have a CEO that is really forward thinking. So when he asked me to, and we, we actually work together with Focused. Um, so we're looking at engaging the community. Civic engagement is the key. Civic, it is, yeah. We're at a time right now where yeah. perhaps there's more civic engagement than there has been for a long time. You know, and yet we see such, uh, uh, you know, we can talk about that because, you know, we talked about before coming in, uh, um, sometimes people having disagreements and agreeing to disagree, but I think that there is some, there is great deal of civic engagement by certain groups. I think that they're indicating by the number of how uh, people aren't voting anymore, which is one indicator yeah. of civic engagement. Um, I think that there's a tendency on the part of a lot of people to want to shut out the noise. There's so much mm. noise going on right now. And there's so much uh, negativity and there's so much, uh, people are just pulling back and they're just saying, you know, I, I don't want to be a part of that. Yeah. So that's what we're trying to say. We need them engaged, everyone. We need everyone engaged. Yeah. And, yeah. and no, no example of uh, the, really larger than what happened last year, mm -hmm. the unexpected victory of Trump. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No example larger than that indicates mm -hmm. what showing up to vote yeah. actually, Absolutely. actually means. I agree. And the consequences thereof. Totally agree. agree. Agree with him, disagree with him. The fact that there, yeah, th there were a lot of people who voted, mm -hmm. but then there were a lot of people who did not still. Yeah. You know, we still, it was what, second or third highest total number yeah. of votes, which was still not all of the people. Correct. It was not a majority of mm -hmm. the people still mm -hmm. voting who right. have, who, who are registered to vote or mm -hmm. are, who are of age to vote, and they mm -hmm. still didn't vote. Right. So that goes back to the no vote, no grumble. So mm -hmm. how, how long has that been around? Oh, we've been over, over 10 years now, no vote, no grumble. And we've been just, uh, we're not high profile, although we have done some gubernatorial debates that were somewhat high profile. We tend to be, I like to call us the worker bees, you know, the volunteers, and we have lots of partners, and we've just been in the trenches. We've conducted just, I don't know how many uh, voter registration drives, and it, it's been, um, and I've had students that have just been incredible working with us. So it's been a fun number of years that yeah, I've been yeah, with yeah. them, yeah. Yeah, I, I, a few years ago, I was uh, region chair uh, for the Democratic Party, and one of the things I'm more proud of is that I was actually able to pull together a group of five to ten people, and we would set up uh, re voter registration booths. Mm -hmm. What I what I did was uh, I had contact with uh, some of the uh, owners of um, uh, farmers markets. So there are several farmers markets across the island. So I coordinated with them, and they said, "Okay, well, we'll as long as you do wide open and it's not partisan, we'll give you right. a booth." Right. So we got to go there with the booth, and we got to set everything up, and we, over the period of six weeks, and this was in 2014, over the period of six weeks, we got 500 people registered to vote, and for the Democratic Party, we got 250 more people registered Democrats yeah, in six weeks at, at, I think, three different locations. That's impressive. So it wasn't yeah. something that, was, that could go mm -hmm. on. It was sustainable. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of mm -hmm. different factors. You always mm -hmm. need the people, right, mm -hmm. that can do that. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think that having the opportunity to be out there to engage the people mm -hmm. in a conversation, to yeah. let them see, look, this is how simple it is. Right. Fill this out. I can't mail it in for you, but here, right. do that. Yeah. We, we took it a step further. We actually did voter registration drives where we walked house to house. Oh, wow. We knocked on doors, and uh, we had... Uh, we, we cut turf where we actually looked at who in the house was registered, who wasn't. And we would, when we knocked on the door, if Mrs. came to the door, we'd say, is Mr. home? Because, you know, we noticed you're registered, but he's not. And we'd enter into, lot, and, and again, it was incredible. We, we had specific districts. We couldn't do this statewide. We didn't have enough volunteers. But in those specific districts that we went into, we saw an increase in voter registrations. Now, it didn't actually... It didn't increase sure, right. voters. S some areas saw an increase in voter participation, actual voting uh, on the day of the election, but most didn't, which is why we're, we're ranked last in the nation. So what's your position then on the mail-in vote? 
Of course, we support that. Yeah. You know, of course, we're going to want to see that actually happen. I don't know why <laughs> it's taking. Uh, we can talk about the politics going on in that square. There's a lot of politics there. I, you Baratania. know what? I didn't get. I, I'm on the neighborhood board, uh -huh. and it came to the neighborhood board uh, through the League of Women Voters, and it got presented. And my neighborhood board. I didn't. I don't think I realized how I would consider perhaps conservative my neighborhood board was. They refused to pass an endorsement of that hmm. bill. Did they just give the neighborhood a reason? Board. Did they give a reason why? They didn't think it was necessary. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that was it. They just okay. think it was necessary. They, what they didn't want was they didn't like the idea that well, if you're going to do mail-in voting, that means you're going to reduce the actual number of polling places, which would save us a lot of money, <laughs> etc. Okay. Uh, that, but that was the debate. I'm like, okay. There was no winning that argument. Yeah. Through, I was like, okay, I, I get that there's more going on to this than just what these numbers mm. and statistics say. I think. Okay. I, but I, I found I that fascinating. I yeah, I, I find that fascinating. Yeah. I didn't hear that one. Yeah, so. no, I, but not all. Not some neighborhood boards voted in favor of it. You know, it, but, but we we made pass. it we made it so easy for yeah. people to vote, unlike these. And, and but what's interesting is because I belong to a larger group. Uh, to hear what's going on in other states where it's becoming harder and harder yes. to vote. That I find fascinating. Hawaii doesn't realize just how special and lucky we are to not have those kinds of really distasteful politics being played at the state level. Exactly. The, the gerrymandering yeah, of the districts, the voter ugly. suppression, yeah. all the different ways that yeah. they're going about. Mm -hmm. And it's all Republican-controlled districts and, and states. I thought we weren't going to get into... Yeah. No, just kidding. This is politics in Hawaii. That's what it is. <laughs> You're talking but to the it's former chair, that are doing so it's hard that. for exactly. me to shake that. But. This whole show is politics in Hawaii. So. <laughs> um, but, this, but just looking at it, I mean, yes, it's true. I mean, yeah. it, it, I know. They want fewer people to vote. I know. It was like the guy in Montana. Uh, there, there was a, a, a bill in Montana to do a similar thing. They were going to reduce the number of, of polling places. They were going to increase the number of mail-in and other, other ways of getting people to vote. Uh, they wanted to do this special election in a different way. Rather than costing, you know, what, uh, $750 million, they wanted to do a mail-in voting that was going to cost like a third of that. The Republicans in that state were up in arms, and they literally said, we can't have everybody in this state vote. We'll lose. That was, they caught that on air. So I think that needs to be understood. I think it needs to be yeah. really uh, yeah. expressed exposed. and exposed. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Absolutely. So. Absolutely. And, and I'm, I'm, I, I think it's a positive thing, a number of the, uh, I guess, court cases uh, across mm -hmm. the state yeah. that are across the country that right. are that are flipping these that are changing these rules that are not that are not uh, disallowing some of the bans and some of the voter ID laws mm -hmm. that are mm -hmm. um, that are actually beginning to address the question of gerrymandering districts mm -hmm. and how that needs to be perhaps redone because it's, some of that is blatantly yeah. ridiculous and, how and, that works. And I got to say that I'm a little older than you are, just a little, but uh, I think that during my generation we took for granted so many things that we just felt like would never ever be challenged because they were just, we, we, we took it for granted. They were the right things to do so they would all be in place. But I think there's a wake up call happening all over the nation right now that you cannot take these things for granted. These, yeah. these were hard earned and uh, these rights and these laws that were passed were hard earned and we need to be vigilant. All the more reason for us to be civically engaged. Absolutely, yeah. and, and how yeah. is it that there are so many people who are willing to give these up? Yeah, I think it's out of ignorance. I, I, ignorance and and blind ideology. Yeah, they believe that, that this is the best. Even if it it could be looked at statistically, and if you do the math, sometimes they're voting against their best interests, mm -hmm. whether they realize that or not. I don't yeah. know. Well, you mean you're talking about the Trump phenomenon? Now? Well, certainly okay. the Trump phenomenon, but for in other areas too. I think yeah. I think that we've heard the talking heads, and and then, you know we all watch this political junkies that we are, and yeah. hear all the opinions being expressed and. I think it's general consensus that the state, the, Nash, the United States, is so fed up with what's going on in Congress that there yeah. was almost this decision that uh, for, for some people who voted for Trump, it's like, well, we know he's terrible. <laughs> Let's go let him go and But and he's really different and he's yeah, outside. Right. And, but uh, we're like, let's yeah. take this bomb and throw it into Congress and blow everything up. Well, unfortunately, we see some of the... And we're, we're yeah. seeing some of the consequences, consequences and losing some of these rights and losing yeah. some of these like global positions right. that we've had. Right. I, I think that stuff is going to come back to bite us in ways that people I, don't understand. I totally, so. agree. I totally so, agree. So uh, yeah. we, we have to take a break. Okay. So uh, that's the first segment of our show. So thank you for joining us. Oh, this is Think fast. Tech Hawaii's Movers, Shakers, and Reformers. I'm your host, Carl Campagna. Thanks again to my guest, Mr. Alex Santiago. Uh, we're going to come back and we are going to discuss the Big Tent Theory. So, see you in one minute. Thank you.
Aloha, my name is Stephen Philip Katz. I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist, and I'm the host of Shrink Wrap Hawaii, where I talk to other shrinks. Did you ever want to get your head shrunk? Well, this is the best place to come to pick one. I've been doing this. We must have 60 shows with a whole bunch of shrinks that you can look at. I'm here on Tuesdays at 3 o'clock every other Tuesday. I hope you are too. Aloha. Thank you for coming back. Uh, this is Think Tech Hawaii's Movers, Shakers, and Reformers. I'm your host, Carl Campagna. Welcome once again, Mr. Alex Santiago, Director of No Vote, No Grumble, former chair of the party, State Democratic Party of Hawaii, uh, and all around fascinating person as I'm learning. So thank oh, you so much for, for all that you've done. You and think everybody came back? No, just <laughs> <laughs> So let's After go into the, uh, my topic of the sure. day, uh, which is this Big Tent Theory. So um, I, I can give my thoughts uh, on what the Big Tent Theory is. You have much more history, I'm not aging you, but you have much more history <laughs> in this state with regards to politics. So. Mm. Um, tell us from your perspective what Big Tent Theory in Hawaii means in a political sense. Well, I think what we see is the dominance by the Democrats over the years has played such a huge role in terms of, uh, even during my day, um, when individuals would run for office, they knew that if they didn't put a D by their name, they would, they would very few chance, little chance that they would win. So there was this, this desire on the part of the Democrats to increase the tent, increase the tent. I mean, include everybody in the tent. When I took the role as party chair during a really difficult time uh, that the party was going through, uh, there was this, uh, I'm not going to get into the people who were fleeing the party at the time because there were some, but essentially we still had the discussion about what does it mean to be a Democrat? Is there a certain like list of things you have to agree by in order to be a part of this organization? Or what percentage of those? Yeah, things or what percentage? Other, yeah. I mean, do you do you meet a certain test, or do we simply open it up and say, if you want to be a part, Ecomo might come in? Yeah. And and our our uh, I think the the overall feeling at that time was we open it up. You want to be a part of this? Come on in and be a part of it and participate. And we we welcome and and have. The thing that I want to mention that I see missing in today's discourse is the fact that back then, it was okay to disagree. We could agree to disagree and not vilify the other individual and make, make them, you know, like, well, if you don't think this way, then there's something wrong with you. You know, we, we simply agreed. It wasn't that, personal attack. No, because we were all so different. Yeah. Even during my time during the legislature, I remember, and I talked about this earlier with you, it was really a time when um, there were Republicans, and uh, there weren't that, as many or that many, but they had a different perspective, and they were allowed to voice their uh, perspective and not be shouted down in any way, but respected for it. And some of them were my, I considered them to be my allies and, and friends because I'm not totally, even though I was a party chair, <laughs> I, I don't meet the whole litmus test, I think, for that. Um, but it was okay to agree to disagree and still be cordial and still have the dignity that I think is really important to have when you are talking about passing policies for everyone. There has to be that level. And, and, well, uh, you need it. And that's where some, some people say, if we had a stronger Republican Party here, mm -hmm. and, and mm -hmm. other people will argue that it's more strong than you think it is, mm -hmm. um, if we had a stronger Republican Party or more representative Republican Party, mm -hmm. that our discourse, our political discourse, and our policies, the conversation would be better. Mm -hmm. It wouldn't be. It wouldn't feel so one-sided. Mm -hmm. It wouldn't feel so hopeless mm -hmm. to so many people because mm -hmm. there would be much more of a debate mm -hmm. and much more of a respectful debate hopefully mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but much more of a debate on issues mm -hmm. and less about this is what we're doing and that's what we're doing and no one's going to say anything otherwise that's mm -hmm. kind of how some people feel mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so just to so okay go back to the idea of, sure. of, of big tent okay big tent in in the definition of it is uh, big tent theory is there's not an ideology there's not one single 
ideology that the entire party gets behind and agrees upon. Mm -hmm. I see that as being fairly impossible, that an entire grouping of people, 10, let alone 10,000 or more, will agree on 10 ideas mm -hmm. in exactly the same way. Mm -hmm. I think that's impossible, absolutely true. Uh, but it's more about how you do that, how you go about the process, how you have those discussions mm -hmm. as well. But the question that comes out of that is, if you've got a party that is in such a dominant position here, and we have a big tent, so we have everybody, we welcome everybody, <laughs> You can be a Republican last year, now you can be a Democrat, right. it's okay. What does it really mean, once again, to be a Democrat? What is the value of, of being the big tent when it comes to actually passing policy? Is it a value? Is it a virtue? Is it a problem? So uh, over the years of what you've seen happen and the changes, uh, some, some of the Republicans have become more extreme. Mm -hmm. So some of the more moderate Republicans have fled. They mm -hmm. said, yeah, we're going to go become mm -hmm. Democrats now mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. I don't agree with that mm -hmm. extremism. Mm -hmm. it, 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 has that been a consequence of the Big Ten? I, I'm not sure because in the Big Ten, we have as extreme individuals as well who yeah. tend to, to say, you know, they, they, I remember uh, the term dino or rhino used right. often by individuals who say... Still used. Yeah, I know, <laughs> in name only. But, but the point being that um, the, the question I think that needs to be asked is when you have a platform that a party comes up with, to what extent are the individuals who put a D or an R next to their name, to what extent is the party expecting those individuals to abide by this platform that was developed by this entire party <laughs> with all of this, right. the, the whole thing going on, and as an elected official having to, had to deal with that, you know, there was back in our day, I'm going to start using that more often in my yeah, older age, sure, sure. Um, there was an understanding and a flexibility and a, and a, and a way to uh, deal with that, I think, that, that allowed it to exist. In, in our present time, I see um, it's still happening, but in a, with a little more tension. Well, yeah. a bit more tension going on. Well, that's one of the, interesting. I mean, that, that, that's the, the great point you make there is that the platform itself is, mm -hmm. what are the expectations? Mm -hmm. Now, working from within that square building, yeah, everybody who says they're a Democrat, and those who come over and say, I'm going to be a Democrat, they have to actually sign something mm -hmm. and say, yes, I will uphold and pursue this platform. That's what they're actually saying. But that isn't what actually happens when opportunities come up from session to session to actually pursue something that is in that mm -hmm. platform agenda, mm -hmm. and nothing happens. Mm -hmm. And we won't get into the accountability question of that in a moment, but it, it, my question is this. Sitting in those seats, are they trying to make that decision based on what they really feel is representative from their district? Or are there other forces that are suggesting that they ignore it or leave it alone or drop it. Mm -hmm. uh, how, do we, how do we understand when they don't go along with that democratic agenda? There's a, th that's, there's so many answers and so many, so many questions <laughs> that could come from what you just asked. I mean, um, I, I think that every elected official has a responsibility to his district uh, pretty much first and foremost. They, they elected that individual. So some of these D's who are in conservative districts, they, the districts expect them to act in this moderate fashion. And those who are in very, very more uh, liberal districts expect them. And, and the same thing with the Republicans. So in answering the question on what they do when they're in that seat, are they being more loyal to the party, to their constituents, or to some other forces? This begs another question, right? I mean, that's why I asked yeah. you. Are there other forces at play when you have such low voter turnout in areas where these individuals sitting in seats really don't think that it matters one way or the other because uh, very few people in their district vote anyway? And or no one ever runs against them. No, or nobody runs against them. Then you look at the real, in, in, in recent memory for me, the real um, shady side, <laughs> I don't know how else to put it, where big money and these other influences are dictating policies that for me as an insider watching what's going on, I find it obscene. 
Yeah. That's the only word I can use. It is obscene. And then I look at these individuals that go back to the district and how do they justify it? And then the question becomes for civic engagement, to what extent are the people in their districts informed about what they just did? Yeah. And the case in point, when they're not allowed to, quote, vote on issues, major issues, whatever they might be, ones that I've been pushing as well, the constituents can ask them, where were you on this issue? And they can answer either way, depending upon who they're talking to. So I find that obscene, disgusting, yeah. and needs to be changed. Well, it's an accountability question. Absolutely. I mean, it, it really does dive into that right. part of that whole thing. Uh, transparency, but transparency by itself isn't always great. Mm -hmm. You can't always have somebody watching everything you're doing when you're trying to make something happen. Right. I can get that point a little bit, um, but it's the accountability side. It's like, okay, what did you do and why did you do it? Right. Or I noticed that you didn't vote on this stuff. Mm -hmm. Why did you not vote on it? Why did you abstain? Or why mm -hmm. did you, why, why, were you, why were you not there for 83% of an mm -hmm. issue that you said you would otherwise be there for? Right, right. Why were you not even present at it? So I recently had this conversation with one of the reporters at the Advertiser about why they were reporting upon what actually occurred when a non-vote was taken. And the reporter's response was, because most of the public out there don't care. And they don't understand it anyway, because the minutia you're talking about is so complex. And I'm sitting there thinking as an educator, wait a minute, shouldn't your role as, a, as the reporter to educate the community about what just happened and why, and then have yes. the constituents hold their legislators accountable for why they didn't question exactly. why the vote wasn't taken? And I got nowhere. Got so, nowhere. so that's the, I, you know, I mean, I know you asked about the bigger tent, but we've kind of... <laughs> but that, but that's, that all plays in. It, it plays in because unless you have a, um, a, a public that is informed and engaged, you're not going to have this discourse, yes. which, which, which begs me to, to, in a roundabout way, because I know we're running out of time, just say that there has come a point in time when parties have become less and less, in my opinion, uh, where the, the general public is. The general public is sitting out there saying, you Democrats and you Republicans on the extreme ends of the spectrum, I don't agree with any and all of what you're talking about. And I and, don't trust and what I don't you're trust trying to do exactly. anyway. Exactly, and look at what's going on in Congress. Yeah. And it's about power and it's yeah. about people saying, it, it, this is too much. So the educator in me says, okay, so we, we have a problem here. We have a serious problem of a disconnect. And this yeah. disconnect is not being solved. Right. So anyway, I can go I, on. I, I, and, but I agree with you. I agree with you. What I, I, what I really, what I really want to do more of, and what I appreciate that you have done is that when you've gone door to door knocking, mm -hmm. and what I would like to do is not, not, not take a report card per se, although those aren't a bad idea necessarily. Mm -hmm. But take, by the way, this is what has happened, yeah. and here's what was voted on yeah. and not voted on, door to door. What do you think as a community member? And by the way, mm -hmm. you know, let your legislators know. Yeah. I think that would be a great, huge start, but the volunteers for that. So yeah. unfortunately, we're at yeah, the end I of know. our show already. <laughs> so thank you for joining us. Thank you, Mr. Alex Santiago, for oh, yeah. joining us. I think it was a great conversation. I truly appreciate it. Uh, looking forward to next week. Uh, but thank you for joining us. This is Think Tech Hawaii's Movers, Shakers, and Reformers. I'm your host, Carl Campagna. We will see you next week.